Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday devotional for January 30th, 2022. For announcements this morning, um, I would remind you that next Sunday, February 6th, will be a Communion Sunday. So please remember to have your elements ready, uh, bread and grape juice or wine or crackers if you don't have bread, another fruit juice if you don't have grape juice or wine. I think God understands these things, <clears throat> and I think so a lot more since COVID. Our silent meditation actually comes from one of my old high school teachers, my band director, Dr. William Sand. <clears throat> At the time, I was thinking about going into music education, and this was his advice. Don't get your first teaching job in your hometown. They know you too well to respect you. And boy, we'll see how that applies to our gospel reading today. <clears throat> so let's continue with our service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let's join together in our profession of faith. We believe in God the Father, creator and provider, who gives all good things, seen and unseen. We believe in God the Son, Savior and Redeemer, who died for our sins and rose again. We believe in God the Spirit, teacher and comforter, who dwells in us and holds us close. We believe in God, the source of all help, mercy, and love. We continue with our call to worship. <clears throat> Offer God your worship and your praise. Before God formed us in our mother's wombs, God knew and loved us. Offer Christ your love and your devotion. Before we drew our first breath, Christ consecrated us as his own. Offer the Spirit your gratitude and your thanksgiving. Before we heard the call to heal the world, the Spirit sustained our every heartbeat. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. We will offer God our worship and our praise. And join me in the spirit of prayer, please. Holy God, we come to worship today to hear your good news, to hear of faith, hope, and love ringing out from your kingdom. We know that doubt, fear, and hatred can shake even the strongest. Shape us into faithful and hopeful people. Fill us with your love that passes all understanding. We pray this together. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> a prophet's call follows a certain pattern in our scriptures. God calls, and the prophet makes excuses, or even runs the other way. God persists, promising strength and his own presence. And the prophet finally turns toward God and the new challenge. Our call to do God's work in the world may not be as dramatic as Jeremiah's call, but our excuses may be just as heartfelt. Too young, too confused, too scared, too old, too busy, too uncertain, too overwhelming. But friends, let's take a moment now and consider the persistent call of God in your life or in our community's life right now. Consider that call and then ask yourself, what is stopping you from responding? And we're going to take a few moments to do that now in silence.
and Amen. Although this time of reflection ends now, please don't let that be the end of your reflection on your call. And hear this good news. The God who calls us into new challenges remains a faithful guide as we grow into them. Confident in God's love made known to us in Christ Jesus, know that you are forgiven and you are set free to grow in grace and follow God's call. Thanks be to God. We come to our children's time, so I would ask if the young people aren't already gathered around the device, please pause the video for a moment and bring them around. And if you have the bulletin downloaded, there is a picture there. It's a picture in the front. We see a girl who is unhappy, depressed. And if we look in the background, we can tell why. There's a group of kids back there that look like they're saying not such nice things about her. That they've kind of ganged up on her, bullied her. They make her feel very unwelcome. Now I hope, I hope you never have and never will experience this. But it happens especially with young people, where one person ends up being the outcast, the one that's sort of chased away from everybody else. And not for any good reason. My goodness, people can come up with the strangest, silliest of reasons to pick on one person. If this has happened to you, or if it does, please, please remember, there's one person that will never do that to you, and that is God. God will never chase you away. God will always be right there with you, even if you are alone. I share this story with you because in our gospel reading today, we'll hear about a time when this actually happened to Jesus when his old friends and neighbors turned on him. And they didn't just tease or bully him. No, they got very angry and wanted to hurt him. And things worked out okay, but Jesus understands what it feels like to be rejected by people you thought were your friends. So again, please remember, God will always be there with you. Amen. We come to the time to lift up our prayers, gathered as a virtual community of faith. Um, and I would start us off, certainly we know, now we're hearing some good news that sounds like the Omicron variant may be peaking in, I think I heard in mid-February. But nonetheless, I know talking to nurses and other people who work in hospitals, they are so overwhelmed, so tired, so frustrated. <laughs> Not to mention the people that are sick themselves. So Lord, we would lift up this whole situation to you. We hope that there is a bit of good news somewhere out there, but we know right now there are many, many people here and around the world that continue to need your healing touch. And also, Lord, there are many medical people here and around the world, health care workers, doctors, nurses, staff, nursing home staff. They need your strength and your energy and your perseverance. So please, we ask your blessing in all the ways that it is needed to deal with this. And now, folks, let's take a few moments in silent prayer to lift up our own concerns, and also if we have joys to give thanks. Let's do that. And amen. And let's join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. We come next to our reading of Scripture, and we mention Jeremiah. Now let's hear about that call when God first called him. This is from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, <clears throat> and the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. We turn next to Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. And now we turn to our gospel, Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. And if you recall, this is the continuation of Jesus' visit to his hometown that we began talking about on January 23rd. <clears throat> then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, <clears throat> Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is that there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon, a foreigner, by the way. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian, another foreigner. Oh, when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Here in the readings, in a tough day to be a prophet. Our message this morning is entitled, Familiarity Breeds Contempt. Please join me for a moment of prayer. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When I was in college, I worked part-time at a Subway sandwich shop. And actually, I'm proud to say, it was the second store that Subway ever opened. Store number two. Anyhow, while I was in my senior year at college, I also got married for the first time. No, not because we had to, but because we wanted to. So one night, as a married, young married man and I'm working at Subway, an old grade school friend comes into the store. I hadn't seen him in at least eight years. And I tell him the good news that I'm now married. Hm, guess what? He laughed at me. Yeah, he laughed at me. He couldn't believe that I was married. He had known me since first grade. We were the ones that had to sit cross-legged in front for the class photos. We had ridden the school bus together, gotten confirmed together, even gotten into some trouble together. But he just couldn't wrap his head around the fact that I was now married. I was a different person now, but he just couldn't negotiate the change. So he laughed, a nervous laugh, I think, probably a mixture of surprise, and suddenly being faced with the fact that something, something in our little world, had now changed forever. Well, I can imagine Jesus' friends and neighbors in Nazareth reacting the same way when he announced to them that he was indeed the long-awaited Messiah. Now, the Gospel says that at first they responded positively to this good news. But the excitement didn't last long. Almost immediately, they started taking Jesus down a peg or two. They started saying that this couldn't possibly be the Messiah, because they had known him when he was just a little kid. They had grown up with him. They knew his family. Nah, he couldn't be the Messiah. Well, Jesus anticipates their next insult, saying that they're going to tell him, Doctor, heal yourself. Now, this saying can mean a couple of different things. It could mean, Jesus, you are delusional. You are not the Messiah. Get your act together before you say another word. The saying could also mean, All right, Jesus, if you are the Messiah, put your money where your mouth is and show us your supposedly miraculous powers right here, right now. Whichever way Jesus anticipated that they would mean this saying, it was clearly not a compliment. Sadly, Jesus had read the crowd correctly. They were full of doubts, insults, and disbelief. Well, okay, there probably were some, some people there who believed, but it sounds like the majority of the crowd had nothing but scorn and disrespect for him. So then Jesus turns the tables on the crowd, subtly judging them the same way God had judged the people of Israel for centuries. This was a people that was not faithful to God, and frankly, they did not deserve God's blessings. Now, I say that Jesus subtly judged them, but maybe not so subtly. He points out that long ago, during a famine, God sent the prophet Elijah not to help the people of Israel, but to help a widow who was a foreigner. And the prophet Elisha was not sent to heal lepers in Israel, but to heal a foreigner. The point is clear. God had been so frustrated with the chosen people's lack of faith and obedience over the centuries, that even in the past, God chose to bring about miracles for foreigners instead. In other words, if Jesus' old friends and neighbors in Nazareth reject him, he'll go, he'll take his miraculous powers with him, and he will go to people who will believe in him. These people have rejected Jesus, so he is leaving them now to their own resources. Ouch. 
And as the gospel reading continues, things almost end very badly for Jesus. The crowd chases him up to the edge of a cliff, planning to toss him off. But Jesus' time has not yet come. And the text tells us that he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Now, in our book study at Salem UCC, we are currently reading What Happens After You Die by Pastor Randy Frizee, the same book that folks at St. Paul's UCC read a few months ago. In this book, the author stresses that we all have a choice to make in life, a choice that will determine our eternal fate. Like the people in Nazareth that day, we can either accept Jesus and believe he is who he says he is, Messiah, Son of God, God in human form, or we can reject him and suffer the consequences. As the author of the book puts it, God doesn't send anyone to hell. He merely honors a person's choice. This... This is that wonderful and yet awful free will that God gives to each of us, the same freedom that was misused by Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God and were then banished from the Garden of Eden. The author rightly says that we have the freedom to choose. We can choose to believe in Jesus, to trust him with our eternal fate, or we can make up whatever reasons or excuses to justify rejecting Jesus. And by the way, not choosing is still choosing. We all know lots of people that just never get around to accepting Jesus. But in God's book, neglecting or avoiding the choice is still choosing, and it amounts to rejecting Jesus. How sad for the people of Nazareth that day to have Jesus right there with them, in the flesh, and yet to allow their little minds and limited preconceptions to cause them to reject the very one, the only one, who could save them. Familiarity certainly does breed contempt, and it did that day. And in the end, I would guess it cost many of them their eternal destiny. Now, folks, this is not our fate. We wouldn't be sitting here in church or watching virtually if we didn't already believe in Jesus, if we didn't already trust him to save us for the fullness of eternal life. We are saved. We are safe. And again, as the author says, we are not just being saved from hell. More importantly, we are being saved for heaven, and then a resurrection body when this world goes away and God establishes the new heavens and the new earth, just as we are told in the book of Revelation. We are saved for, for a wonderful eternal future, being in God's loving presence forever, reconnecting with loved ones, and who knows what other amazing surprises God has in store for us someday. And when we look at it that way, that we are being saved for something wonderful, well, I think it changes how we look at other people. Instead of preaching fire and brimstone to all those unbelievers, although there is truth in that, but instead of that, we could approach others with what is actually good news that God has a wonderful future in store for us, all for the cost of simply believing in Jesus. So, yes, there is a cost, believing, but that's certainly cheaper than trying to somehow earn enough brownie points on our own to get into heaven. I mean, think about it. We always call this stuff the good news, but talking about hell and eternal punishment are not good things at all. Yes, they are true, and that is the fate that awaits those who don't accept Jesus. But that's a really bad way to approach people about believing in Jesus. 
I mean, listen for yourselves. Which sounds better? Hey, you better accept Jesus or you are damned forever. Or, hey, if you accept Jesus, you have an awesome forever future guaranteed. Yeah, doesn't the second one sound a whole lot better? And again, for us, for we who believe, don't be anxious. Everyone here, in church or virtually, believing in Jesus, we've already chosen. We have made our choice to follow Jesus. Most of us probably first made that decision a long time ago. And now we simply apply ourselves to learning more about God and loving God more and more. We are safe. We are saved. Done deal. And we can't ever lose our salvation. So don't be anxious about things like that. But we should be lovingly concerned for others who have either rejected Jesus outright or have never gotten around to deciding. It might be a friend or a neighbor. It might be a family member. If we take the Bible seriously, if we take Jesus' word seriously, then we need to be concerned, out of love, for unbelievers. And we need to find ways to talk to them about this. But please, don't use the saved from hell approach. At least not at first. Instead, try to talk to them about Jesus using the saved for approach, saved for heaven, for eternity, for joy. Tell them it's because you love them and you want them to enjoy what you yourself have already been promised by God. Amen. We come to the time in our service to dedicate our offerings, and we give thanks for the support for our ministries. Even before we were born, God knew us completely, and God has watched over us all the days of our lives. In gratitude, let us offer our gifts now to God. And let us join together in our response. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to us, and grant us thy peace. Source of every blessing, Holy One, you are our refuge and our strength. Receive these offerings and the gratitude of our thankful hearts. Grow the ministries of our churches that we may bring your message of love to a world yearning for your truth. Amen. So, friends, God sends us forth with words of love on our lips. Christ sends us forth with acts of love in our deeds. The Spirit sends us forth with the spirit of love sustaining our very lives. Go in the power of God's love and be ambassadors of Christ's love and peace. And may the truth of the gospel give you courage and comfort as you witness lovingly for Christ in the world. Amen. <laughs>